on the wanderer. <clears throat> what I'm going to put up here is just right out of your intervention. Both the wanderer and the seafarer are found in the Exeter manuscript of um, Old English poetry. There are four what are called major poetic codices, or if you wanted to use uh, improper English, codexes, meaning books, but they're not printed books because they're all handwritten. The Exeter is one, the Junius, which I referred to the other day, um, Junius 11, is, <coughs> excuse me, is another. There's the Beowulf manuscript, it's not actually called the Beowulf manuscript, but that's it, often used for a kind of shorthand. Um, and then the last one is the Vercelli manuscript. We will actually, in the old English material that we will cover, we'll read two things. I think we're only doing wonder in the sea fair. Two things from the Exeter. Um, we're not doing anything from Junius. We're going to do all of Beowulf. And we're going to do Dream of the Rude, which is found in the Riccioli manuscript. All of these manuscripts date from right around 1000 AD. Okay? Um, that is, they were written right around 1000 AD, give or take 25 years on either side. So 975 to um, 1025. This manuscript is kind of interesting because of the wide range of material that it includes. It includes uh, specifically religious poetry and a lot of specifically non-religious poetry. For example, it's in the Exeter manuscript that we have all the Old English riddles um, preserved, and there are about a hundred of them. Some of them are very um, benign and tame, and some of them are extremely dirty, depending on how you read them. And they're, they're designed that way. So if you read this one, <clears throat> um, I'm trying to remember which one it is. I think it's the onion. The onion and, and the key. If you read either the onion and the key, and you go, oh my God, I can't believe they're actually suggesting that. That's saying more about your mind than it is what's actually in the... Um, Poem. So you might want to you know, do a little Google search for Old English riddles, the key, or the onion. But we're going to talk about these two, the wanderer and the seafarer, which are often read as companion poems. Right? They're both about the theme of pilgrimage. Okay. In Latin, peregrinatio. Peregrine, in the Latin usage, is a traveler, okay? not a wanderer, not somebody who doesn't have any um, destination in mind, okay? but someone who has an idea of where they're going. You're going to see that that idea is much clearer in the seafarer than it is in the wanderer. Okay? The wanderer does kind of come across like he doesn't really know where he's going. But we're going to see as we work our way through the text, the author behind it is pretty clear about what the ultimate goal is. All right? Um, and I'm going to, you know, stop at various points, and I'll make some references to the actual Old English text, and I'm going to quibble a little bit with um, Roy Lewis's translation here. Okay? One thing about the title, or titles, whether it's The Wanderer, The Seafarer, Beowulf, Dream of the Rude, none of the manuscripts have these titles in them. All of these titles are titles that are given by modern editors. Modern meaning from about 1800. Um, up until today. Okay? So, 
Always the one alone, long maker's mildness. Though troubled in mind across the ocean ways, he has long been forced to stir with his hands the frost-cold sea and walk in exile's paths. Weird is fully fixed. The very first line I'm going to start ripping apart. Because of how Liuza translates something there. Um, Uh, they moved to 322. Thank you. Yep. Uh, this is the old English for the first line. Off him on haga are ye Okay? And this is where, as I said, I'm going to start picking it apart. Of, okay? Oft. Often. Okay? That's where he gets the always. This is the object of this. Okay? This means the alone or solitary, okay? So the very one. Are means gifts, favors, mercies. Get the kind of I notice it has means. This word is the problem because we use a trans it as longs for ye be death. This is where we get our to buy ye be death. It has multiple meanings. You can translate it as Lisa does longs for, awaits. Expects, experiences. Look at those four meanings and how much they differ. Change this, change this part to something like I, or you if you want. Uh, the employee, no, just put I, a raise. The difference. A raise long for? Yeah. <laughs> Often I, a raise. Longing for and awaiting aren't necessarily the same. They do apply some of the same stuff, but longing for implies there's this deep desire. Awaiting can be like you're just waiting for the red light to turn green. Okay? Expects. Well, if you expect something, it's not the same as longing for it. If you expect something, then there is some kind of assurance that it will happen. Longing for a raise. I have no assurance that it will happen. Experiences. I've had it. I've gotten that raise before. Or I am experiencing it now. Now take Often the solitary one, mercy, favors, awaits, expects, Experiences. Look at the difference between this, really, those. If you translate it using these two, then the solitary one hasn't experienced any mercy. Okay? If you translate it using the bottom one, he has experienced mercy. Therefore, what can he expect in the future? more. Always the one alone long experiences or awaits or expects mercy. 
the maker's mildness. It changes the whole meaning of the poem. Okay? This is why Bede said, not translate a poem from one language perfectly to another. You can get the gist of it. And the reason is because in order to translate it perfectly, you've got to have either in your mind or in the text you have in front of you all for each of the words so that you can choose which one most closely represents Though troubled in mind across the ocean ways, he has long been forced to stir with his hands the frost-cold sea, exiles' paths. Okay, the word there that's translated exiles' paths. You're going to see, I'm, I'm going to love to pick, pull out individual words to um, translate. Raklastas. Raklastas. Okay. The lastus, we still have part of that word in use today in its real original meaning. People who make shoes will talk about the last of the shoe. And what that means is me, the shape of the footprint on the ground. Some people's feet are more curved than others. Some people have high arches, others have low arches, or no arches at all, they're flat-footed, okay? So, this is the footprint. Well, it's wreck. We have a form of this word still in use today. When you call someone or something, or you talk about yourself as wretched. Wretch. So if you're feeling wretched, what you're feeling, the term that gets used in your translation, is exiled. So what are you if you're in exile? Do you have friends around you? Do you have family around you? No. If you're in exile, you are all alone. This is a major theme in Anglo-Saxon poetry, the theme of exile. And you can also say that the wanderer and the seafarer are to some extent about exile. Okay? The seafarer is more about a self-imposed exile, exiling yourself from this world to reach the other world of heaven and such. Okay? So, to walk in exile's paths. That is, the solitary one who, whatever, <laughs> God's mercy, often finds himself walking in exile's paths. That is, he's all alone. There's no one else to comfort him. There's no one else to commiserate with. We've all heard the phrase, misery loves what? Company. Okay? Weird is fully fixed. Now look at your gloss for weird. A powerful but not quite personified force. Closest parallel in modern English is fate. But it's not really fate. Because you can, in the Anglo-Saxon mind, you can turn weird to work for you. Or at least to not be totally against you. How? By the sheer power of your will. By fighting for what you really ultimately believe in. Weird is fully fixed. That means that in this instance, you cannot change your weird. Your destiny, your fate. I think a good way to translate weird is what will be, will be. It's going to happen. Right? And if it's going to happen, then... The person it's going to happen to has an opportunity, depending upon how he or she responds. That weird can be totally soul-sucking and draining and life-killing. 
Or, if the individual has a different attitude, can be less soul-sucking, less life-draining, and less depression, uh, depressing. Okay? So, thus spoke the wanderer, mindful of troubles, of cruel slaughters, and the fall of dear kinsmen. So notice what the wanderer is full of. His mind is full of problems. Doesn't mean he's psycho or anything like that. It means he is filled to the brim with problems weighing him down. What are the troubles, the problems in his mind about? Cruel slaughters and the fall of dear kinsmen. Okay. So what's troubling him is the death of his tribe, if you want, or his people. Often alone, and notice this is in a quote. There's a big critical question regarding the wanderer is how many speakers are there? It begins with the speaker, okay, this little narration, and then we have a quoted passage. There aren't quotation marks in the Old English manuscript, okay? All takes this next passage as being spoken by whoever. Often alone, every first light of dawn, I have lamented much. This is the wanderer speaking. He's saying, first thing he says when he gets up in the morning is, it's crappy to be me. My life sucks. There is no one living to whom I would dare to reveal clear thoughts. Notice, not my mind's thoughts. Heart's thoughts. The heart is where your innermost, deepest, mm, whatever that is, maybe you okay? I know it is true that it is in the lordly nature of a nobleman to closely bind his spirit's coffer. Coffer, his treasure chest. What's he talking about? He's talking about that quintessential British attitude of the stiff upper lip. You grin and bear it. You take whatever life throws at you and you don't talk about it. You keep it all wrapped up inside. To hold his treasure hoard, what do you think? So what's he just told us? A nobleman okay, keeps his thoughts to himself. The weary mind cannot withstand weird. Okay? And that word, withstand. Think about what it really means. With, in Anglo-Saxon, and this is the only way we still use this in a modern, uh, today, in the Anglo-Saxon way. Withstand, with means against. When you stand with someone in an Anglo-Saxon sense, what does that mean? You're in opposition to them. The only way we have that meaning in modern English is with this. To withstand the hurricane, um, negative comments about you, etc. Okay? The weary mind cannot stand weird. Notice it's not just the mind, it's the weary mind, the worn out mind, the mind down over the years. The troubled heart can offer no help to weird. And again, how you translate weird informs how you tr understand the rest of these lines. And so those eager for fame often bind fast in their breast a sorrowing. So what does he mean? The weary mind, the troubled heart, those eager for fame will bust in their soul. He's saying, talking about it doesn't change what will be. Notwithstanding psychologists saying, oh, it's good to get it out, have to cleanse, you know. The speaker here is saying, you can talk till you're blue in the face about not getting a raise. 
Is that going to help you get a raise? You can talk to your blue in the face about awaiting God's mercies. Is that going to suddenly make well, I feel sorry for him. You know, let me give him some mercies. No. Just as I often wretched, cut off from my homeland, far from my dear kinsmen. Notice, three, often wretched, cut off from my homeland. So he's not talking about being in exile in his own home. That his home is dead. He means he's also physically removed. He's now at a different location. And far from dear kinsmen, he said to take his own heart and what? Bind it in fetters. Fetters, manacles, handcuffs, chains. Ever since long ago, I hid my gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth and went wretched, winter sad, over the ice-locked waves. Sought Halsick, a treasure giver. Notice how long this line is, by the way. Halsick, a treasure giver, wherever I Someone in a meat hall who knew of my people or would want to comfort me, friendless, accustom me to joy. Period. You finally get a stop. What's he saying? This guy's really suffering. And I had to bind up that suffering. Ever since, long ago, I hid my gold. But what does he mean, his gold-giving friend? His buddy? No. That's a specific term. His gold-giving friend, Goldwina, it means, Lord. I don't understand why Elisa translates it literally. Okay, Because everyone would have heard that word would have immediately known he's talking about his Lord. The highest person. In so why does he call him a gold-giving friend? Because it was the duty of an Anglo-Saxon Lord to do to his thanes. Okay? Those men who surround and support and fight for him. It was his duty, just as it was their duty to fight for him. Okay? There is this reciprocity between them. We'll fight for you. We'll go off and do your work. The Lord would lead them into it. But you also have to give us treasure. Okay? It wasn't that kind of a quid pro quo where they had a contract. We will fight for you, and in return you give us. This is all just built into the Germanic mindset. So he says he had to hide his gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth. He buried him. Pause here for just a moment. Scholar by the name in a book called A Study of Old English posited the fourfold Germanic ethic. Right? That is, this was a, and the Anglo Saxons are Germanic peoples, right? They didn't have, have this written down. This was just part of their um, mental makeup, right? Four points. First, you have a duty to your Lord. That is, you owe an obligation, you have a responsibility to your Lord. Second, you have to your kin, to your family, to your bloodline, right? Third, to avenge your Lord and kin. Somebody kills your Lord, it is your responsibility to go after that person and exact vengeance. If somebody kills a man, Take something from a member of your family. If somebody rapes a member of your family, it is your duty to exact okay. against that perpetrator. And the fourth 
is a trust in reliance uh, acceptance of it just kind of you know that's the way things are there's nothing you can do about it so just kind of roll with the punches so when the speaker says I had to bury my gold giving friend in the earth what does that say about duty to Lord and duty to avenge Lord or kin? Ability. It's not mentioned at all in here. Probably because, big probably, he's the only one left. He's the only survivor of whatever happened. We don't know what happened that made the wanderer a wanderer. We don't know if he was off hunting and some they're all gone. We don't know if he had been made an outcast and exiled before by his lord. He comes back and he finds them all dead. That's probably not the case because of the fact that he buries his lord. If he was exiled, the guy was no longer his lord. Okay? So he's probably exiled for some other reason. More than people are dead, and he's so. What does he do after he buries his Lord? He says, I went wretched over the waves, winter sad for what he no longer has a people, he a man without a country, which in the Anglo Saxon mindset, like the before them meant he was nobody. He had no identity. Your identity is bound up in the people you are part of. And more importantly, in Anglo-Saxon society, in and around your connection to the Lord's Hall. The Hall is the locus of all civic activity. It is the place where the Lord dispenses justice. It's the place where the Lord dispenses gifts. The place where the Lord dispenses laws and rules. Okay. It's the center of society. So if something happens to the hall, and if the Lord is dead, you can be sure the hall is empty. And destroyed. If the hall is empty and destroyed, then anybody who survived has got to go find a new home. Got to find a new home. So that's what he says what he's been doing. He went out looking for a new treasure giver. Someone who would want to comfort him, he says, and accustom him to joy. Okay, now if you want, I'm not saying you have to, you can look at this and go, hmm, I can read this allegorically. Because the Lord that he put in the earth can be an earthly Lord. Now he's looking for another kind of Lord. One that would know the earthly Lord, but that would bring him to joy. You can tie that reading I just suggested to these lines, to the very end of the poem. Very, very, there are many scholars who want to say about the last added later by some Christian monk who wants to take this relatively thoroughgoing pagan Germanic rant and make it Christian. It's not thoroughgoing pagan Germanic existentialist. It's Christian through and through. Okay? Go on. How cruel a companion is sorrow to one who has dear, few dear protectors will understand. So who's someone who's been in his shoes? He to know how cruel a companion is sorrow. 
to one who has few dear protectors. That person, he says, will understand this. And notice in Leah's translation, there's then a colon. Because what does he apply to? What comes after the colon? Okay. But it could also apply to what comes before the colon, to everything that's been said before. The path of exile claims him. Claims, calls him. You're not patterned gold. And by patterned gold, he means twisted gold, wound gold, gold rings, gold bangles, gold, uh, gold armlets. A winter-bound spirit, not the wealth of earth. And notice the struck lines. The path of exile claims him. Skip the second half line and go down to the first half line of the next line. Winter, um, the path of exile claims him a winter-bound spirit. Now look at the two second half lines. Pattern gold. Okay. Gold is the wealth of earth. He remembers. That is, he who shares my experience remembers hall holders and treasure. The hall holders is not only the Lord. It's all the other things sitting in the hall. Think of, you know, what, what Bede said about Cadman. And they're sitting there in the hall, the monks. They're sitting there in the hall. The beer is making its way around. The heart is way around. They are all hall holders. He remembers the hall holders and treasure taking. The Lord dispensing treasure. How in his youth, his gold-giving Lord accustomed him to the feast. Accustomed to something. What does that say about that thing? It's regular. How accustomed are you to having to drive around and around and around to look for a parking spot? Okay? It happens every day. He is saying that's what his gold friend did at the feast with joy. Joy, day in and day out. When? In Long ago, when I was young. Da 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 da. Emphasizing what about now? He's this speaker has been around the block a lot of times. That has all meaning there is no more. Okay? So you, you start to understand how his mind is full of troubles, how mind weary he is. And so he who has long been forced to forego his dear Lord's beloved words of counsel will understand. That is, if you've experienced what I've experienced, you will understand this. When sorrow and sleep are wretched exile, it seems in his mind that he clasps and kisses his Lord of men. What does he mean when sorrow and sleep together bind up the wretched exile? Have you ever gone through a period in your life where it just seems like every morning you wake up and you're pushing a rock up the hill? And every night when you go to bed, that rock has rolled back down on you? That's what he's talking about. Sorrow together. So what does he dream about? The times when he wasn't full of sorrow. So that it seems in his mind he clasps and kisses his Lord of men and on his knees, hands and head. Okay. That image, laying his hand and his knees on the, uh, his hand and his head on the Lord's knees, that's an act of supplication. He's looking for mercy. He's looking for grace there. 
from his life. As he sometimes long ago in earlier days enjoyed the gift throne. So in his visions or dreams of reaching it around his Lord's legs, putting his head right on his knees, saying, me, okay? But when the friendless man awakens again, what does he see? He sees the seabirds bathing, spreading their feathers, frost falling in snow, mingled with hail. Then the heavier. In other words, for a brief moment while he's asleep, there's a little bit of alleviation of that sorrow. And then he wakes up, and he's still out on the open sea. And who are his only companions? The birds. Sorrow is renewed. Notice, then it went away a little bit. When? When he was asleep. Doesn't do any good to have the sorrow go only when you're asleep. Because what are you when you are asleep? We know this. They may not have understood all the uh, mechanisms of it. You're unconscious. So the fact that his sorrow is alleviated when he's unconscious for his conscious self. Sorrow is renewed when the memory of kinsmen flies through the mind. He thinks back to the days when he was in the hall. Because what hall is he in now? Above. He greets them with great joy. What? He greets who with great joy? The kinsman in his mind. Because he's recollecting days in the hall greedily surveys his hall companions and they always swim away. What? What does he mean they always swim away? Is the hall some kind of subterranean, uh, submarine hall? Who's the devil? What is he actually seeing? Close. It's the birds of the ocean. He sees the birds and his mind is drawn back to his friends in the hall. What is he doing in other words? Yeah. He's hallucinating. Okay. This guy is in a really bad shape. And what do those blankety blank birds do? They swim away. Or they fly away. The floating spirits bring too few well-known voices. Well, what are the well-known voices they bring? The eagle, the gannet, etc. They're not. Hey, George, how you doing? <laughs> Have a piece of meat, you know. Cares are renewed for one who must send over and over. And you've got a gloss down there at the bottom. The grammar and reference of this intense, almost hallucinatory scene entirely clear. In other words, Leuza is saying, I don't have a fig what this means. The translation reflects one commonly proposed reading. Okay. Now, he just told you something there. What do translations do? Every translation is an act of interpretation. Okay? I mean, just look at what we did over here. So when you read Roy Lewis's translation of the song of the Wanderer, the Dream of the Root, and I think we're doing Dream of the Root, and Beowulf, you are reading his interpretation. His interpretation may not be right. In fact, I'm going to really argue 
with a couple of passages when we get to Beowulf, which is why we'll probably be on Beowulf. Right? Because I love Beowulf. I teach Beowulf in Old English at the graduate level and such. Right? Why is this important? Because your translation and interpretation might be different than mine, and yours, and yours, and all the way around. Right? So every time you read a translation, it, that is what somebody is. So I cannot imagine for all this world why it should not grow dark when I think through all this life of men. Okay, now notice where this comes. What has come before? Cares are renewed for one who must send over and over a weary heart across the binding of the waves. Now, another reading of that is that this guy does some kind of astral projection. You know, he goes all short and clannish, and he sends his soul out over the ocean to experience things, and then it comes back, and his life still sucks. So what's the purpose of sending your soul out? Do them. When I you take that spot. Gave up the all four means they died. Who died? The mighty young retainers. Not the old geezers. Okay? The young ones. The guys in their prime of life. Thus, this middle earth droops and decays every single day. It droops. You look out at the trees, and the trees are all standing there tall and firm and strong. No. No. That's an illusion. That's a mirage. The tree, as it were, the tree would be limp, hanging there. All the flowers that you see, all the petals, would be dropping off and dying. Because that's what is happening daily. Everything is dying. The moment you take your first breath, when you come out of your mother's womb, the clock starts ticking backwards. However much time is on that clock. It might be a day, it might be 102 years. And so a man cannot become wise before he has weathered his share of winters in this world. So what do you have to do in order to become wise in this world? Suffer, Suffer and live long. Okay? You have to weather your share of winters. What does that mean to weather the winters? Experience. Experience them. Endure them. Okay. Anglo-Saxon mindset? No suicide. You could not take your bare body as Hamlet you know, thinks about and end your sufferings. It didn't even enter the mind, okay? So, to become wise, you have to endure. You have to experience much. And not only God's favors. You have to experience the drooping and decaying of this world. A wise man must be patient. What's that word patient mean? Think of it this way. Take a seven-year-old kid. Two weeks before Christmas or two weeks before his birthday. Load that Christmas tree with all kinds of wrapped presents. Put the kid down in front of the Christmas tree and say, be patient. What are you telling that child to do? Wait. What does the child know is in those presents? Or in those boxes? Presents. Okay. 
You're telling that child, suffer. That's what you are telling that child to do. It's like putting a plate of cookies in milk before a hungry kid and say, you have to wait until after dinner. And dinner's four hours away. And the kid's hungry and the kid's sitting there. <laughs> you might as well dangle food over his mouth and say, ah. What are you when you go to a hospital? You're a patient. Why? Because you're healthy? You're suffering. Because you're suffering. Okay? It's related to the word passion. You're suffering the passion of love, the passion of anger, passion of hatred, as well as the meaning passion like the passion of the Christ, the suffering. Okay? So, a wise man must be patient. You must suffer, meaning to endure, to take what comes, neither too hot-hearted nor too hasty with words. Too hot-hearted, flying off at the handle. Okay? Short fuse mentality nor too hasty with words. And I could, you know, my mind is just reeling with all kinds of political ideas. I could just, you know, start going off. But I won't. Nor too weak in war. Oh, oh man. Just, it's just sitting there waiting for it to be knocked out of the park. Nor too unwise in thoughts. Okay, notice this is a wise man will be this way. Neither fretting, nor fawning, nor greedy for wealth. No, notice that. Neither fretting over wealth, nor fawning over it, that is, obsequiously seeking it, nor greedy, hoarding it. Never eager for boasting before he truly understands. Okay. I, I can't talk myself. Never saying, here's a red line. Here's a line in the sand. Don't cross it. Before he truly understands. Okay? Truly understands what? This is an Anglo-Saxon context. Don't make a boast until you understand what? The consequences of the boast? What it is you're boasting about? Never say, let's use Beowulf as an example. Never say, oh, I'm going to go down to the land of the Danes and I'm going to kick Grendel's butt. Without one, knowing how hard it's going to be to get to the land of the Danes, first of all. Two, knowing how big Grendel is. Knowing how many people Grendel has fought. In other words, being able to size up Grendel and say, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Or, use the modern political context, drawing a line in the sand without having completely thought through, okay, what am I going to do if he does go over the line in the sand? That's the problem the United States is in today. President Obama drew a red line off the cuff without thinking about it. Okay? Somebody used chemical weapons, may have been Assad, may have been the rebels. Somebody used them. And so now there's that red line. Whose credibility is on the line? His, the government's, or the country's. Right? Depends on what your political perspective is, ultimately. But that's not what? Thinking through the consequences. A man must wait. When he makes a boast, until the brave spirit understands truly whether the thoughts of his heart will turn. In other words, before you make a boast, you better do some pretty profound soul searching to see whether you've got it in here to go ahead. All right? Personally, politically, 
I think Obama would have been much better off if he'd launched something 10 days ago. Politically, I'd have entirely disagreed with him. Okay? Entirely. But I think credibility-wise, he'd have been much better off to do something 10 days ago. Or frankly, two years ago. When something could have been done before all the wacko, my terminology here, scholarly language here, all the wacko nut job Islamic jihadis who were no better than Assad got into the picture. Okay? The wise man must realize how ghastly it will be when all the wealth of this world stands waste. What does he mean, all the wealth of this world? Exactly what it sounds like. All the money, all the gold, all the silver, all the platinum, all the jewels, all the gems, all the banks, all the savings accounts, all the stock markets go boom. To make the Great Depression look like a little drop in the bucket. As now, here and there, throughout this Middle Earth, Walls stand blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling. Notice the two sides of that. Okay? The wise man must realize how it will be when all the wealth of this world stands waste. As what? As now. So when he talks about all the wealth of this world, he's not only talking about things like gold and silver. He's talking about human civilization. Everything that we have done over the past 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 5,000, however long you want to say. Okay. How it will all be waste, empty. Old English word, if I remember correctly, that's actually used there is idel, idle, idle, not being used, just as now. And I think if I were to shoot a film of this, I would have this grizzled old geezer, you know. Um, No, not Ian McKellen, because he needs to be really, my terminology, manly and strong. Um, guy who played the sergeant major in We Were Soldiers once. Oh, I can, man, I, his face is right here. No, this guy is tall. He's got a peppery beard. He's got long hair and a very deep, gravelly voice. Sam Elliott, thank you. Okay. Look up Sam Elliott, okay? Put a big long beard and have him standing beside a broken down, decrepit Anglo-Saxon hall and saying these lines. Just as now, here and throughout this Middle Earth, walls stand blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling. Well, why are they beaten by wind? Why are they empty? What happened to the mighty young retainers? They checked out. There's no one to keep up the buildings. Unfortunately, like Peck Hall. You know, this is one building I would love to see blasted by wind and totally, you know, just giant sinkhole. <laughs> then maybe we'd get a nice building for the Broids. The wine halls topple. Wine hall. For those of you who are Tolkien fans, Manduseld, okay, Theoden's Hall. The wine halls topple. Their rulers lie deprived of all joys. That's a nice euphemism. How deprived of all joys are there? Are they? They're all dead. Okay. The proud old troops all fell by the wall, meaning they died defending the wall. And again, if I were to shoot this, 
I would probably have Sam Elliott with like a rib sticking up. Paralleling, he's the last one alive. And that's what happens. War carried off some, sent them on the way. One, a bird carried off over the high seas. We're not talking pterodactyls coming and, you know, picking up people <laughs> wholesale. And, ah! and off. What does he mean, one, a bird picked up? Yes, scavenger. I was just reading the other day to get a little gruesome. There's a place in Texas. Texas is a big state. I'm sure there's a lot of area to do this. Where one of the universities has a quote unquote body farm. Okay? It's a for a forensic study. Isn't that UT? University of yes. 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 Bad faced man covered in an earthen grave. Kind of taking us back to long ago I hid my gold giving friend in the darkness of earth. So it's almost like the wanderer has gone back to where he is originally from. And he sees his destroyed hall, and he talks about the friends who have died and been carried away. And then maybe you see this little mound in the ground. And he points, <laughs> one, a sad-faced man covered in an earthen grave. The creator of men thus wrecked this enclosure. The enclosure? Earth. Our world. God did this, the speaker is suggesting. Until the old works of giants stood empty. And you've got the old English there for works of giants. Inta, you'll work. Okay? The Anglo-Saxons built with timber. They did not build with stone. They looked at things like the stone buildings of London and the stone buildings in the city of Bath and a couple of other towns and were utterly amazed. How do you do this? Moreover, they looked at things like Stonehenge and thought, how did they move those big giant rocks like that? If you've ever seen... Um, Gladiator. It's like the scene when uh, Russell, Cruz, uh, Russell um, Crowe's character and the other slaves first come to the Roman Colosseum and they see this thing and it's just amazing. Why? Because they're used to pigsties essentially. Until the old works of giants stood empty. It's that same word. Idle. When the Anglo-Saxons went in, some Roman settlements were empty. You know, we're still finding new Roman villas and such that have been destroyed and covered over without the sounds of their former citizens. That is, you go into the city or the town of Bath, you're an Anglo-Saxon, the year is 500. You go into this town, and there's no sound. Water is not flowing into the baths because the pump houses aren't working. There's no singing. There's no music. He who deeply considers with wise thoughts this foundation and this dark life, this foundation means this earth. <laughs> Oops. He means this ground and this dark life, old in spirit, often remembers so many ancient slaughters and says these words Where has the horse gone? Where is the rider? Where is the giver of gold? Hold on just a second. Actually, let me try it on this.
Spoke these words. This is the old English. Where quam mag? Where quam mago? Where quam madam yiva? Where quam simla yisetu? Where sind and sella dramas? Alabert bruna, alabirn wiga, alithedness thrim. Okay? Where is the horse gone? Where is the rider? Where is the giver of gold? Where are the seats of the feast? Where are the joys of the hall? Oh, the bright cup. Um, oh, the bright cup, oh, the brave warrior, oh, the glory of princes. That is called the Ubisunt motif. Ubisunt, where are? Okay, you see it a lot in Latin literature. You do see it sometimes in Old English. If you're familiar with J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, those lines are very similar to what uh, I don't remember who does it in the film because I hate the film so much. Um, it's either Aragorn or Theoden seeing something like this when they're going around the burial mounds. Okay, And in the film, when they sing it, they're singing it in Anglo-Saxon. They use Old English. Because Tolkien said Old English was essentially the language of the Rohirrim. Well, notice what he's saying there. Where's the horse? Where's the rider? Where's the giver of gold? Where are they all? They're dead. That's where they are. How the time passed away slipped into nightfall. This is the kicker. As if it had never been. The civilization is wiped away. As if it had never been. That's scary. People want to know, once they're dead, that the world will have known they lived. In other words, they want to leave a mark. They want to leave some kind of legacy behind. Okay? What's he saying is the legacy of this civilization? None. It's as if they never were. There still stands in the path of the dear warriors a wall wondrously high with serpentine stains. In other words, the building isn't totally demolished. There's a hall, or the wall of a hall, and it has serpentine stains. Does that mean blood stains, you know? No. He's probably talking about how the hall was built. Okay? And that it, it was built to have patterns in its construction. A storm of spears took away the warriors, bloodthirsty weapons. Notice, the spears are thirsty for blood. Weird the mighty, in storms batter these stone walls. Frost falling binds up the earth. How does it bind it? It covers it. The howl of winter when blackness comes, night's shadow looms, Sends down from the north harsh hailstones in hatred of men. What kind of outlook on life is this? It kind of sounds like that old pagan Germanic mythology, right? You live, you die, nobody knows you ever lived, and darkness covers the earth. That's it. All is toilsome in the earthly kingdom. Notice how he specifies where. The working of weird changes the world under heaven. Ah, he introduces an idea here. An idea that's been present throughout the entire poem. But now he solidifies it. He makes it clear. Weird, he says, produces... Change in the world. 
What does he mean by change? Here, wealth is fleeting. The old English of this passage. Herebeth Feolana, Herebeth Freundlana, Herebeth Monlana, Herebeth Mylana, all of this earth and ye still idol werpeth, awareth. Here, wealth is fleeting, and I don't think you should have used the word fleeting. The Old English word was lama, okay? From which we get lean, loan, and make it into its verb form, loaned. Here, wealth is lean. It's not rich and juicy and fat, okay? But it's also a loan. Every one of you who's taken out a student loan will come to understand how fleeting that wealth is. Because what must happen? Bingo. It's got to be paid back. Unless President Obama waves his magic wand and, you know, it all goes away. Which means it doesn't go away. It just means the taxpayers, you know, will bear it. Here, wealth is fleeting. Here, friends are fleeting. Sometimes while we live, meaning our friends turn their backs on us. But that's not specifically what it means. It means here friends come and go. Here friends die. Here man is fleeting. Here woman is fleeting. All the framework of this world will stand idle. He translates it empty. I like idle better. Idle means useless. When what? When all the men and women and wealth and friends are gone. Notice, they are loaned. The loan has to be given back. So said the wise man in his mind. So the speaker here says, everything that's been said before is wisdom. Now we usually take wisdom to mean truth, that there's truth in it. Sitting apart in meditation. Ah, notice, he doesn't literally say this. He's thinking this. Why? Because what does the nobleman do? He binds up his thoughts in his heart. He doesn't give voice to them. He is good who keeps his word or keeps faith. The Old English, if I remember right there, the word for uh, word is Yeah, it is. Who holds his trail, his truth, his faith. He is good who holds to his faith. And the man who never too quickly shows the anger in his breast, unless he already knows the remedy a noble man can bravely bring about. Again, that, that idea of don't boast until you know that you can fulfill what you're going to boast. Okay? It will be well for one who seeks mercy, consolation from the Father in heaven, where for us all stability stands. Right? All stability. What is that juxtaposed to? What is life on earth full of? Change. Change. Every day changes. Life changes. People change. Wealth changes. Okay? There's no permanence here. There's no stability 
here. So what's the speaker ultimately saying? You want permanence? You want stability? Don't search for it here. Friends will not always be your friends. What's he ultimately saying? You want happiness? You're not going to find it here. Well, will anybody say amen to that, you know? You're not going to find happiness in another person. I've been married nearly 30 years. My happiness does not reside in the person of my wife. We disagree sometimes, you know? Nobody, to quote Jerry Maguire, completes me. That completion, according to this speaker, is elsewhere. Right? This speaker is saying, you will not find peace and happiness here. If you search for it here, what will you find? That here, wealth is fleeting, friends are fleeting, Man is fleeting, life is fleeting, civilization is fleeting. J.R.R. Tolkien, in his uh, essay on Beowulf, titled Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, which I'll talk about more when we get to Beowulf, said that all Anglo Saxon literature is ultimately about one theme the death of man and all his works. That's it. It's he believed it's all about nothing we do lasts. Face it. <laughs> and that's what the wise man here is saying. Accept that reality. Okay. So how is this a peregrinatio, a pilgrimage? He is saying, he is suggesting all of us here Our recklessness. All of us here are exiles. What all of us here want, according to the wanderer, is to find our true gold friend, our true gold giver, one who won't be placed in the earth. Jesus, you know, kind of mentality. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll do the seafair on Tuesday. See, we're already behind. You want to do your reading?